I'm in the big leagues. Tony don't miss me. Ballin' like Houston. Hey, feelin' like Whitney. I need a bag, bruh. Send it too quickly. I'm making his dog. Like I'm in the big leagues. Told him that I gotta go, dog. I'm riding a road, y'all. I think that I'm back in my bag now. So I need that go, y'all. Got his when he throwin' a fastball. Just too quick for it. Pillin' off like the whip orange. Seen the effort this piss poor. I got too much. I got a What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of Another Turnover. Podcast where an NBA fan with zero basketball credibility gives his opinions on what's going on in the NBA. Opinions that nobody asked for. As always, I'm your host, Mr. Chris Aaron Murphy, aka Aaron. And ladies and gentlemen, let's just jump right into it. So, this past weekend, we had a pretty good weekend, a really good slate of NBA games, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. So if you can remember from this past Friday, I put out my three marquee matchups. So I want to start there and I want to talk about where I was right because I was right about one game and the other two games I was not so right. So let's take a look and dive right into those. So let's start with the Miami Heat and Charlotte Hornets. So I was right about this game. I picked the Miami Heat to win at home. They defeated the Charlotte Hornets 114 to 99 this past Friday. Now the Hornets got off to a pretty fast start. Uh, I think they were up either 7 to 0 or 7 to 2 um, very early on with about about 7 8 minutes left in the uh, in the first quarter. Um, but the Heat quickly bounced back and they definitely did not look back. They were really in control really for the remainder of the game. I think the closest that the Hornets ever got the lead or the deficit I should say down to was about 8 points in the early on in the fourth quarter. But like I said, the Heat never really looked back. Um, they out-rebounded Charlotte pretty significantly. The rebounding totals were 60 to 37 rebounds for the Charlotte Hornets, so a pretty massive difference. Heat actually had 16 offensive rebounds as well, so that hustle and drive for the on the offensive glass was there for the Miami Heat. And they also had 54 points in the paint, so they definitely controlled pretty much the tempo and the entire pace of that game with their rebounding and their points in the paint score. Um, but you had excellent games, that is, from the Miami Heat players. Excellent game for Jimmy Butler. Had 32 points, 10 rebounds, and 5 assists. Bam Adebayo put in 26 and 19 rebounds. You had my uh, or way too early season uh, MIP pick, most improved player, Tyler Hero. He put in 26 points with 9 of 13 shooting and 4 of 6 from the three-point line. So the Miami Heat with a really, really solid victory against the Charlotte Hornet team. I believe they're... I believe they're five and one, if I'm not mistaken, or six and one, one of the two. Uh, so Miami Heat playing really well in this early season. But let's talk about where I was not so right, aka wrong. Let's talk about the two games that I did cur- did pick incorrectly. So um, the Philadelphia 76ers did defeat the Atlanta Hawks at home in Philadelphia in a rematch from last year's Western or excuse me Eastern Conference semifinals. So I did think that Atlanta was going to win this game, but the Sixers actually ended up winning 122 to 94. So it really wasn't close. I definitely thought we'd see a repeat of last year's playoffs in this game, but I don't know who that was that showed up in Philly, but it definitely wasn't the Atlanta Hawks. So they were down 28 to 13 after after the end of the first quarter. Like with the offense that they have, with what they normally score, I was like, who in the world is this team? Um, 13 points after the end of the first quarter was uh, a, definitely an anomaly for the Hawks, but it like I said, they pretty much got destroyed for the rest of the game. This one really was never in jeopardy for Philadelphia. Um, the Hawks just couldn't put together a string of defensive stops at all. Um, I, I mentioned to a coworker a couple weeks ago about how I was a little concerned about the Hawks' defense. Um, but I think this one was more of an effort thing. Um, they just came out really slow and really sluggish. But I do think that Philadelphia really, really wanted to win this game. Um, they, you know, the remnants of last year's playoffs are probably, you know, still ringing in their brain. Obviously, there was no Ben Simmons, you know, in this game, which obviously Philadelphia might as well not play with Ben Simmons in last year's playoffs either, but that's a story for another day. I don't want to keep, you know, beating down on Ben Simmons. But um, the Hawks, you know, they shot poorly across the board. Um, no, Nobody really had a good game. Cam Reddish led in scoring um, off the bench with only... I believe 16 points is what he had, but no one had more than 16 points. But four out of the five Philadelphia starters scored 15 or more points. You had Curry, Maxi, Embiid, and Harris, uh, Tobias Harris, that is, who led 
all scoring with 22 points for the Philadelphia 76ers. So I definitely think this was a, I know it's still early in the season, but I definitely think this was a statement victory for Philadelphia, not so much, you know, for everybody else, but for the Philadelphia 76ers, you know, as a whole, beating the Atlanta Hawks, you know, the team that knocked them out in seven games without Ben Simmons. Um, but they destroyed Atlanta in the paint. Um, they took advantage of 19 turnovers for the Hawks. So like I said, the Hawks kind of came out slow and they were a bit sluggish. Um, but Philadelphia definitely took that victory. So shout out to them. But excuse me, let's talk about that third marquee matchup that I had picked out. The Utah Jazz and the Milwaukee Bucks from this past Sunday, Halloween. Um, so the Utah Jazz actually beat the Milwaukee Bucks on the road in Milwaukee, 107 to 94. Um, I, I was watching the watching some of the highlights from this game, and I definitely feel as if the Bucks are suffering a little bit from championship hangover. You know, uh, team wins a championship and finally get over you know you know over the mountaintop. They finally achieve the pinnacle of you know their profession, and the next year they come out and they're eh they're mediocre at best. Um, so I definitely think the Bucks are suffering a little bit from championship hangover. Now, that being said, you know, they didn't have, in this game, they didn't have their two co-stars, um, or two of their big three, I should say. There was no Drew Holiday, and there was no Chris Middleton. But they haven't really played all that great this year at all. Um, they're only three and four. Um, only one more win than San Antonio Spurs, who are two and two and six, who are playing terribly. But... You know, I, I always got to throw the Spurs in there somewhere. Uh, but Giannis struggled shooting, shot 3 of 11 from the three-point line. Um, and like I said, no co-stars with, you know, Chris Middleton and Drew Holiday. They weren't there to play. So I really don't know why Giannis is taking 11 threes in a game. You know, that's definitely not his game. So I don't know if that's whether to, whether that the Utah Jazz defense was, you know, kind of clogging the paint. He wasn't able to get to his normal spots or if he was just settling for jump shots. But 11 threes from Giannis. Probably not the best use of his game, at least in my opinion. But Utah always is a really good regular season team. They play hard and they're well coached. I've always liked Quinn Snyder as a coach. Um, and defensively, they they're really they're really great. They move the ball really well. Um, Donovan Mitchell had a solid game. He put in twenty eight points in four three point shots. But for me personally, like I'm just not sold on the Utah Jazz. Like. They just remind me so much of a team that's built for the regular season. Kind of like how the Toronto Raptors were in the DeMar DeRozan and Kyle Lowry era. Like, they're you know they're going to be solid during the regular season, probably arguably top three, but they're just like, you don't expect much from them. Um, and this is just, you know, my personal opinion. Like, I just don't see the Utah Jazz making a deep run at the playoffs with the personnel that they have. I really, really like Donovan Mitchell. Um, and they have solid pieces. I mean, Joe Ingles coming off the bench, Jordan Clarkson, you know, uh, Royce O'Neal, obviously Rudy Gobert is their defensive anchor. So they're a solid team, but they're just, I just feel that they're built for the regular season. Um, I just don't see them being anything more than that. Um, I just feel like they're, they're missing a piece. They're missing another, you know, solid bucket getter on that team. But, you know, who knows? Maybe they'll prove me wrong, but I just don't see the Utah Jazz doing any sort of significant damage in the Western Conference this year. But we'll see. We'll see what happens. But let's transition a little bit. I want to talk about over the past week some of my favorite players to watch, my favorite players and performances over the past week. So let's start in Denver with Nikola Jokic, center for the Denver Nuggets. He has been balling out um, somewhat under the radar, which is Crazy to think because he was last year's MVP, um, and no one's really, you know, kind of mentioned him so far, but um, he had a 24.19 rebound outing against Cleveland. He had an 11.16 rebound and eight assist outing against the Dallas in a victory in a 26.19 rebound game in a really, really tough game against Minnesota um, with Carl Anthony Towns um, going up against them. So he's back to his MVP caliber numbers for sure. Um, and his numbers, what I love, his numbers really translate to wins in a sense. Like, you know, you can have players that, you know, just put up a bunch of stats and like their team is barely winning, but he is a difference maker on the court. I still marvel um, at his, you know, playmaking ability. Um, and defensively, I mean, he's, he, he's not, he's not the best defensively, but he's definitely not, you know, horrible, kind of run of the mill defensively, which you know, surprised me. He's definitely improved just a little bit on the defensive end. 
Um, but like I said, he helps lead his team to victories um, in that game where he only had 11 points. You would think, oh, like, you know, just 11 points, that's not a whole lot. But 16 rebounds and 8 assists, so he was doing all the other things, all the dirty work um, for that Denver Nuggets team. So shout out to Jokic. He has had a really, really solid week, one of my favorite players. But I want to give flowers to a player while he is still here. Um, I want to give, as much as it pains me to shout out any Los Angeles Lakers player, I want to give a shout out to Carmelo Anthony. He's been one of my favorite players to watch over the past week. Um, the year 19 for Carmelo Anthony, which is pretty incredible. Um, but he had 23 points off the bench versus Houston earlier this week, uh, or last week, I should say, and then had a 24-point outing off the bench against Cleveland. Now, in these games, um, he shot 62% and 75% respectively from the three-point line. So he is balling out. Carmelo Anthony, year 19, you know, he's like he's like five or six months older than LeBron, but he is playing, you know, he's playing like 2008 Carmelo Anthony with back with the Denver Nuggets. So he is playing really well. Um, like I said, I want to give him his flowers while he's still here. Who knows how much, you know, time we got left for Carmelo. Could this be his last season? Maybe, maybe not. We shall see. Uh, but a crazy stat that they showed in that Houston game. So uh, for all my, you know, old heads, people who've been watching basketball for a long time, Carmelo Anthony played with Kenyon Martin for years in Denver. Ken Kenyon Martin was their, their starting power forward um, for a number of years. But in the game against Houston, he played against Kenyon Martin's son, Kenyon Martin Jr., which I thought was just a crazy statistic that they threw out there. Like, he has been in the league long enough to play against one of his teammates' sons. So I thought that was pretty incredible. So shout out to Carmelo Anthony. Really solid week with the Los Angeles Lakers. Ugh. But uh, last player that I want to give a shout out to is Jimmy Butler down in Miami. Jimmy Butler is playing really, really well. This are, these are some of his stats over the past week. He put in 36 points in a game. He put in a 17.14 rebound game and a 32 point, or excuse me, 32 points and 10 rebounds. And in another game, he had 27, 7 assists, and 5 rebounds. So really, really solid games from Jimmy Butler across the board. He is, like I said, I think the Miami Heat are either 5-1 or 6-1, if I'm not mistaken. And they've had some really solid victories. I think victories against, you know, Brooklyn and Charlotte. And I think they also beat Memphis as well over the past week. Um, but his field goal percentage in these games is like NBA 2K my career numbers. Like in the game, he scored 36 points. He shot 71% from the field. In the game that he had a 32-point outing, he shot 63%. And in his 27-point game, he shot 66%. So crazy numbers from Jimmy Butler. And, you know, obviously, we, we've we grown accustomed to him not necessarily having the highest point total, um, but being more well-rounded across the game, you know, with points, rebounds, and assists, um, getting his teammates involved, being that really vocal leader that the Miami Heat um, has really sought after um, in the, you know, the absence of Dwayne Wade over the past couple of years. So Jimmy Butler has played really well, and he has definitely been one of my favorite players to watch over the past week. But let's transition again. Let's go into some news. Let's talk around the association, a recurring segment that we have here on Another Turnover. Um, so a report came out yesterday um, that Zion Williamson is two to three weeks away from being a full participant in practice. Um, so positive news on the healing of his broken foot. Like he had uh, foot surgery, I believe, on his right foot in the off season. Um, Coach Willie Green said that he has been able to, and I quote, able to do some cutting and some limited on-court work. So that's good news. So it looks like his injury is progressing in the right direction. Um, he is expected to be out another two to three weeks. Uh, but then they are hopeful that he'll be able to be a full participant. Um, so hopefully Zion can come back healthy and stay healthy. I really hope the Pelicans organization figures out a way or some sort of regimen to, to keep him healthy. Um, I know I talked about a report in some of his weight issues and they are saying he was, you know, over 300 pounds, which for a six, you know, six, five and a half, six, six frame, like, He's definitely going to have to come down and wait, at least in my opinion, I would think, um, you know, back when he was with Duke, I think he was in that 260, 265 range. And that'll probably be his ideal playing weight if he wants to have a long, sustainable um, career. Um, but New Orleans is definitely struggling without him. They are tied for the worst record in the league. Um, they are currently one in six. Um, so they need him back. Uh, they definitely need all the help they can get. 
Um, Zion was putting in some pretty, you know, pretty incredible point totals last year and showing off his underrated playmaking ability with the New Orleans Pelicans. So hopefully, like I said, the Pelicans organization can manage his injuries, manage his recovery and get him back to, you know, being that player that we believe that Zion Williamson can be. And hopefully I'm really, really hoping that he has a long career that I just hope he is able to get his conditioning, get his workouts, get his diet um, good in a way where he can have a sustainable career. So Zion, best of luck to you, sir. But some other piece of news that we had around the association, not necessarily around the association, I would say, um, but over the past week, uh, we, we've we seen some questionable things, some qual- some questionable calls by the referees. And I just wanted to highlight some of the things that we've seen so far, because I thought, I thought it was kind of ridiculous. So um, in a game against the Pistons, the Philadelphia 76ers center, Joel Embiid, we all know Embiid, um, he dunked on a player, and I don't think it was an and one, but he felt he got fouled, but he dunked on a player. He screamed, you know, just trying to hype himself up, and the ref gave him a technical foul. And I was watching, I watched it a few times, and I'm like, what What? what was the technical foul for? So Embiid even said himself, he's like, he's like what? He's like, no, no, no. Like, I, I was talking to myself. I was trying to hype myself up. Um, So he got a technical foul for basically yelling at himself. Um, But Kevin Durant, um, in the game against the Pistons as well over this past week, uh, this past weekend, was trying to fight through a screen, get through a screen, I think, with Kelly Olenek, um, and was assessed a flagrant two and got ejected. Got ejected for fighting over a screen, you know, trying to be physical. We all know Katie's got a slim frame. Um, Fighting over a screen and got ejected with a flagrant two. Um, In a third incident, just this season, uh, or just this week, I should say. So Trey Young and the Atlanta Hawks, I can't remember exactly who they were playing, but I was watching. He felt that the referee missed a call. He tried to, you know, draw a foul. NBA is trying to cut down on these non-basketball moves, but, you know, Trey Young, I definitely felt there was some body contact. He got fouled, didn't get the call, and he tries to get back on defense and inadvertently bumps into the ref. He gets fined $15,000 for that. Like, gets a technical foul for bumming into the referee, gets fined $15,000. Like, this, I really don't feel like this was intentional at all. Like, you can go back and watch it. He bumped into the ref. Like, he felt he got fouled. He turned around. The ref was right in front of him. So, he bumps into the ref and doesn't even, like, really make the ref move at all, but gets around him. And he gets a technical foul. I'm like, $15,000 for that? Like, for me, like... I feel as if the NBA referees lack accountability. And what I mean by that is, you know, they're human. Like, everybody makes mistakes, right? Like, you know, they're never going to get a call perfectly right in every situation. And that's fine. But there's no accountability for the NBA referees because a player can't say anything about the players, like, in a post game or in an interview on a podcast or whatever it is. Um, Because if they mention the referees, that's pretty much an automatic fine. Like, the NBA will do that, you know, that two-minute report in close games. So, basically, the last two minutes of a game, if a referee misses a call or if a call, you know, was made that shouldn't have been made, they'll give that two-minute report. Well, that doesn't really do anything. So, like, that two-minute report, if a referee misses a call or makes a call that they shouldn't have and that kind of helps sway the game, that's it. That game's over. There's no do-over. You're not going back to that game um, and having, you know, having a rematch based off a referee missing a call. So so I really feel the referees lack accountability. I think the players should be able to find a respectful way to not necessarily come after the referees, but criticize the referees because players get criticized every single day. Um, so that's just, that's my opinion on that. Um, like I said, it's not necessarily a, a piece of news, but something I noticed in three separate games, and it's been happening over the past few years, just feels as if the referees just lack accountability, and I feel as if the league should step in And they should have a way to hold referees accountable. But let's transition. Uh, I want to transition again into my top five teams from the week. So I want to give a list, you know, as 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 my guy Stephen A says, fluid list, my top five teams over the past week in the NBA. So let's start at number five. So number five, got the Golden State Warriors. Now, Golden State Warriors are five and one. They had two wins this week. Uh, Both wins were over Oklahoma City, um, which, you know, one of the lower tier teams in the league. And they had a really tough loss against Memphis. So with this tough loss against Memphis, um, I had them dropping a few spots um, after, you know, being up. I think I had them either two or three, you know, last week in my top five teams. Um, But overall, they're still playing really solid basketball, moving the ball really well. Um, Like I mentioned, they were supposed to be holding it down for Klay Thompson to get back. 
Um, but they are they are thriving so far in the first six games of the season. So my fourth team, my fourth best team, top team of the week, I've got the Memphis Grizzlies. Um, they are currently four and three. They've had some really solid outings. They beat, like I said, they beat Golden State. They beat the Denver Nuggets in a close game um, last night, I believe that game was. And they also beat, or excuse me, lost to Miami in a very, well, no, they got blown out against Miami. But Miami is one of the best teams in the league so far. Um, but mostly they're here. I've got them ranked here because of John Morant. He is putting in some amazing point totals. Um, he is, you know, facilitating the ball really, really well, getting to the basket and driving. So they're mostly here because of his incredible play. He's playing like an all-star, and they're also playing without Dylan Brooks as well. He's still dealing with an injury, and I think they're expecting him to be back soon. But I've got the Memphis Grizzlies at the fourth spot. But the third spot, I've got the Utah Jazz. They are 5-1. and one. Um, They've had a road win, like I mentioned, against Milwaukee. Um, a close loss against the Chicago Bulls, one of the better teams in the league as well. So I feel as if I was kind of obligated to put them here just because of their record. I mean, they're 5-1. and one, and They did have a nice victory against Milwaukee on the road, but... Eh, yeah, they're they're here, five and one, Utah Jazz. But the second team I've got, uh, second best team in the NBA, I have the Miami Heat. Um, so they have been probably arguably the most impressive, um, other than the first team I've got. Um, but they've had wins against Brooklyn, wins against Charlotte, and wins against Memphis. And these were all blowout wins. These weren't close victories. Um, they are solid on the defensive end. You know, with Jimmy Butler, Bam Adebayo, PJ Tucker leading the defensive end. And offense is arguably just as good. Tyler Hero has been balling off the bench. Um, Jimmy Butler has been leading them offensively as well. He has been their primary scorer. So the Miami Heat, I feel as if um, they are the second best team so far, at least of this past week. But the number one team, number one team that I got to show love to in the NBA, um, I previously mentioned, is the Chicago Bulls. So they've had wins um, against Boston and Utah and lost, I believe, by one one or two points against the New York Knicks in a really, really tough game in Chicago. Uh, but they are definitely surprising me. I I had them being a the playoff team, you know, I had them, I think, either 7th or 8th. I'd have to go back and double-check that. Uh, but they are looking like a for-sure playoff team. Obviously, we're still early. We're seven games into the season, but they're 6-1. and one. Uh, Like I said, I predicted they would be in the play-in tournament. Um, but they definitely could make a run at being top three in the um, Eastern Conference with the way that they're playing. DeMar DeRozan um, and Zach Levine are doing the bulk of the scoring. Lonzo Ball is amazing with facilitating, and Vucevic as well is having a really solid season as well. So Chicago Bulls, my fifth favorite team or top five team so far of this past week. So shout out to them. I am looking forward to big things from the Chicago Bulls team. But ladies and gentlemen, that is all the show I have for you today. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much for listening. Got some exciting games coming up later on this week. So I am looking forward to talking about that this Friday. But if you could do all the good things, like share, subscribe, all that goodness. Tell your friends, tell your uncles, tell your mama about the show. And I would greatly appreciate it. But I will see you on Friday and I hope you have a great rest of your week. Take care. Yeah, I told him I'ma hit it out of stands. I deserve another hundred bands. I deserve another hundred fans. Told him this was always in the plans. I just did it cause they said I can't. Blowing euros when I'm down in France. Labels asking how I build a brand. Told him put a check up in my hands. Who I got time, no cap. Made a few checks, but they all in the rest.